you're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 112 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is my podcast partner in crime, writer, blogger, and constitutional scholar, Jessica Salaji. Hello, four four and seven years ago. Speech by your favorite president. Ugh. Did you see that exchange with the woman who called me Miss Constitutional Instructor? Yeah, I saw some of it. <laughs> so this week, you know, I have a rule that I, I don't go on other people's sandbox. I don't play in their sandbox unless I've been asked a question or tagged or something because I feel like, you know, I, I just try not to go fight on other people's. I got enough fighting going on on my own page. But I've been a little bit bored, so I've been wandering off from my own yard a little too often, and I got in an argument with this woman who, and it was under, like, it was on a post that I made somewhere else, but she honestly and truly did not believe that Donald Trump was impeached. (laughs) Y'all, And she was, I mean, she was livid that I would even imply such. And so she called me, she's like, I don't know. And I told her to go pick up a government, a book on how government works. And she, you know, so she, she proceeded to tell me that I was misinformed and that I had no idea what I was talking about. And I might be a constitutional instructor in my own head, but she had four and a half years of um, college classes and had graduated with honors and I was wrong. (laughs) So... Don't you have six years of college classes? I do. I do. Ah. Plus, I do. I, mean, I, I sometimes read on Facebook and on the internet, too. So that adds like 12. Yeah. I mean, if you're just going to compare uh, compare degrees, at the, I mean, your, your stack of crap is higher than hers. Yeah, but but you know it's terrifying because she her whole justification whole justification was that the Senate acquitted, and so she had this whole line of thinking laid out, and so she honestly and truly did not like. I thought she was a troll, but then I looked on her profile and we had twenty two friends in common, and she honestly and truly believed that, and it's alarming because there are people walking around this country who think that Donald Trump was not impeached and even Donald Trump knows he was impeached. Like we can get into the politics of why and the, the games and the shenanigans and all of that, but he was, (laughs) you can argue the, the legitimacy of, of the impeachment, but articles of impeachment were presented to the Senate. He was put on trial in the Senate and he was acquitted. Uh, Jesus, I, man, (laughs) these people breed and they educate their children. They're homeschooling right now. Uh, well, not that sending them to a government school is any better. Oh, geez. Here we go. These are our opinions, not those of all on Georgia. And certainly not those of anyone who may appear on this podcast who's not speaking or anyone who's not saying them. But I'm right. <laughs> I mean, you can't hand your kids over to the government, over to the state for eight hours a day and not get a statist back. Dun, dun, dun. So those were your quarantine activities. <laughs> Uh, you know, Dr. Cool is still operating. Uh, we're not doing preventative stuff, but we are certainly responding to no AC calls. Of course, this morning, it's quite possible to have a, uh, as we're, as we're recording, uh, quite possible to have a no heat call because, uh, Friday morning was, uh, uh, was 45 degrees up where, where I am. And then of course it'll be 90 by next week because nothing else is, you know, it isn't crazy enough in the world right now. We have to throw weather in there. Yeah. I mean, at least you don't have to worry about how to dress anymore because we don't go anywhere. I have put on a lot fewer collared shirts. You know, usually my uniform shirt is collared and all that stuff. And I'm like, I just grab one of my uniform t-shirts. I'm like, eh. No, I mean, everybody I'm going to see is in pajama pants. Why am I <laughs> going to wear a button down? <laughs> I mean, the, the stupidest conversation I have with people is like, if you're going to be around tomorrow, I'll be by. They're like, where the hell am I going to go? So. Pretty much. Uh, it was announced last week that shelter in place uh, is through the end of the month and that the primary election would be moved to June 9th. Thoughts? Uh, 
I don't like the shelter in place anyway. It has no teeth, but I don't like it. I Loeffler was on uh, Maria Bartiromo the other day and I asked her about Kemp uh, keeping the beaches open. And, and she says, well, the police can enforce the social distancing. I'm like, ooh, that's an unforced error. I mean, I understand Kemp said that the uh, DNR can, can do that, but all she had to say was, I'm sure reasonable people can enjoy Georgia's beautiful beaches uh, uh, without uh, while maintaining social distance. Whew, that was an unforced error. Well, she's an outsider. This is new to her. Yeah, she's an outsider. Right. Yeah, her husband owns the New York Stock Exchange. She's been around politics. For sure. And she's just, I think she's having, uh, I guess, unforced errors is what you want to call it, all over the place. I mean, she's an unforced error, but... Well... I think this is more than I think she thought it was. This is probably, all right. So when I worked on Dobbs campaign, he got, uh, he was really d- depressed because it's the first time in his entire life people didn't like him. And sure. it wasn't that they didn't like him. It was that they liked somebody else more. And this was probably the first time in her life because she's up until now has been mostly apolitical. She, her, her politics were green, make me money. Uh, so she got along with everybody. This is probably the first time that she's ever been like attacked publicly. And when you get appointed from straight from the street to a high office like that, it, it's a big shift in your, in your life. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's a different pace of life, I think. And then we also have all these unprecedented circumstances that, and she's she's under scrutiny. She did. It's not like she got elected. She was appointed. So I do I do think that she's under. People are looking at her more closely. And whether that's fair or not, I mean, that's not that's a, that's a personal opinion. I think it's fine because again, she was gifted a Senate seat. But um, oh no, she asked for it. I mean, she right. put her she put her name. I don't. I don't. Please don't take it for feeling sorry for her. I'm just saying it's it. She she may have wanted. Uh, she may be kind of regretting it now a little bit. Well, but I think it speaks to the fact that she doesn't know what she's doing. Right. Look, we all we all say we don't like career politicians, but there is a, a game in the Senate that's at a very high level. And then when you're getting on uh, Fox Business and you're getting nationwide exposure, there's there's a, a, a nuance to that 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 takes uh, takes experience. Uh, and you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be thrown I mean, thrown into the Senate. I mean, it'd, it'd be fun, be funny, because I'd, I'd be a one. <laughs> I would do the one year and just make everybody up there hate me. Well, that's kind of what I mean. We talked about that on the show. That's kind of something that we wanted to happen. We wanted somebody to just be a placeholder and then have a an election the way we were supposed to. But she obviously made it clear that she's w- willing to continue to buy the seat. So whatever, but. I just, I I am of the belief that our senators are people who should have experience. I don't want an outsider in the Senate. I want an outsider in every other, you know, elected office. But I want someone who is experienced and seasoned because of what the Senate is. There's only a hundred of them. Right. Uh, I... I'd like to go back to the original Constitution mm-hmm. and have the, have the state house appoint their representative in in the Senate. The Senate the senators represent the state, uh, and the the people's house is 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 the House of Representative, but the state is supposed to appoint the uh, elect the our senators per our original Constitution, and that would be, of course, that would leave Ralston in charge of that of that process. So. Are you okay with with the election being moved to June 9th? I mean, no, I'm not, but they didn't ask me. But I, I guess the only, the, the, I just don't want to hear about it. Not even the candidates or anything. I just don't want to hear about the complaints about the election and, and that it's being moved. And, and we're going to talk about some other stuff that they're already getting sued for, but it's just, it's such a it's such a mess. I don't want to hear about the the details. Like there's it's a lose lose situation. It sucks. 
you're, you're mandating that people stay home, but then you're mad that they're moving the election. And the, the Secretary of State's office only had, I think, two or three weeks within the law that they could move the election legally anyway. And we don't even know if this is going to be over in May and June. I mean, we have no idea. So we're just kicking the can down the road and everyone's fighting about it, but nothing's in stone. Nothing in, about our lives is in stone right now. And if you're a candidate who's surging right now, this this is a, a this is not I mean not great. If uh, if it costs more money to to run to run your uh, uh, to run your primary, and then if you're going to compress the time. I guess it doesn't with sixty days, sixty days for for the runoffs. Uh, then you're going to come out of the runoff and immediately uh, have to turn around for uh, uh, for November. I mean, it's going to be. It's going to be interesting. It, it certainly has an effect on the election cycle. Sp- speaking of the election cycle, we have a guest this week. Woo! Who is it? We've got Representative Matt Gertler coming in who is running for Congress. Awesome. As if I didn't know. As if you didn't know. <laughs> Joining us today is State Representative Matt Gertler from Tiger, Georgia, candidate for Congress in Georgia's 9th District. Matt, great hey, to Matt, have how you. How are you? Hey, doing good, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for you joining a... us. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. You, you, I'm <laughs> stepping all over you. Yeah, well, no, I'm sorry. I know we get we have a very limited time because uh, Mr. Gertler is an important person, and we are not. Uh, you had a big fundraising announcement recently, topping buck uh, seventy five in donations. Yeah, yeah, it was really humbling. Um, you know, when you get involved with you know these types of campaigns, I've been a state rep for four years, but you know, I announced for Congress about about 58 days ago, back in uh, February 12th. And uh, when you get started, you just don't know, you know, how much support you can get. But it's been humbling to have, you know, almost a thousand donors. We we topped for our first FEC deadline, 175,000, I think, and plus 800 dollars there. And so it was just very awesome to have that kind of support coming from. You know, individuals, it's really a grassroots campaign, and it really they wanted a candidate that's, you know, proven. I think the most conservative voting record in Georgia. I'm 31, so I, th- I think that I'm one of the youngest in the nation for the Republican side running for Congress, which is really attractive to a lot of voters. And just being, being able to step against the establishment, I've been fighting those guys, you know, since day one uh, at the Capitol. So all those things combined, you know, I think is really attractive, you know, for a lot of people in the 9th District. And they got behind us, and we're just very, um, you know, humbled and happy that um, the campaign is going great. So, as a as somebody who's known you since before you were even elected and everything, but has known what you stood for and obviously supports you, I I love that you have such a massive fundraising number because I think it surprised a lot of people. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, they they were. I heard some of my um, critics, you know, my. My opponents and you know criticizers they were saying that uh you know i was sort of a i could be a dark horse but they really they underestimate me all the time it seems like you know when i ran for state rep uh, i remember people telling me i don't think this guy's got a chance in winning but we've come out like 15 points ahead in our primary back in 2016 and then we won the runoff by 61 points and we've just been winning ever since so <laughs> yeah it's good to be underestimated for sure yeah for sure they they kind of just ignore you while you're kicking butt so i think it's awesome but it's a unique time, too, because you've never had a campaign during a pandemic before or a shelter in place. So how has that kind of changed how you're on the campaign trail? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think if I can win an election during a pandemic, I can pretty big <laughs> in the election. So um, it has been interesting. We've been adapting and overcoming. Of course, you know, our, one of our, we have the best grassroots um, campaign here of any candidate. And we always had that happen. Uh, we almost got 100 volunteers. And we were planning on knocking on doors basically right, right when we had the special session end, but we weren't, you know, allowed to do that because, you know, shelter in place and all this. And um, so it has made it, made it interesting. But ironically, we had some of our best fundraising numbers come in in the last uh, two weeks, you know, of the pandemic, which is ironic and just surprising. But it was just like I said, it was humbling. And uh, it sure is interesting for sure. You know, a lot of people are out of work, you know, especially in restaurants and things like that. Um, so, uh, but we, we're still fundraising and it's still going great. And, uh, you know, I just think that it is just wild what's happening and, uh, you know, all my opponents are feeling this right now. And so it's, you know, it's everybody's, you know, game right now for the election. And we only got about 
60 days ago now since they moved the election. You know, we found out yesterday that we, we were all planning on uh, May 19th. Now we're up to June 9th now. So we get extra 20 days or so. So we're just evaluating that right now and just uh, hitting the ground. You know, it's it's exciting. Well, you weaponized memes, which is brilliant. Uh, it's <clears throat> it, it works as a, as a marketing strategy and it's 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 uh, outstanding because it's getting shared where I am. And, you know, I'm in Paulding County. Right. <laughs> Yeah, we were using social media a lot for sure. You know, you got to do that. I think 80% of people get their news off Facebook. And so, you know, we're just, you know, phone banking, doing everything we can to get out to the votes, putting mailers out, uh, you know, social media, uh, digital, everything we can do besides door knocking. Because that's really, you know, that's one of the best ways to reach voters and something I did as a state rep. You know, I knocked on like 10,000 doors my first election personally. And then the next election, uh, we knocked about the same. And then we knocked on, I think, about 30,000 doors just in the House District 8 that I present up here in Towns Union, Raven, and White Counties. So we were planning on, you know, knocking on doors. Hopefully, it might be a blessing in disguise, maybe, um, you know, moving the election back up when, you know, the pandemic and the public perception goes down that we would be able to door knock, you know, at least for, you know, 20 to 30 days, hopefully, since they moved it. And hey, you know the job sucks, right? <laughs> I think I, I, you know, I've been serving in the Georgia House, so I kind of got my training there. You know, I, you know, when you go up to D.C., I had a lot of, I was talking to Congressman, uh, you know, Thomas Massey and Rand Paul and those guys, and they said, you know, there's a lot of intimidation happens here in D.C. You know, how do we know you're not going to fold? And I, you know, I told him a couple of stories about David Ralston and uh, Nathan Deal and <laughs> and Chris Riley and all these guys that have come after against me and through intimidation and threats sometimes. And so, yeah, I definitely, uh, I know what I'm getting myself into a little bit at least, uh, going up to uh, D.C. So, I was say, they stick you in the basement and tell you to dial for dollars? <laughs> I do. Well, you know, as somebody who follows state politics a lot close, more closely than I follow national politics, I was super bummed to see you leaving the House because not only do you vote no and oppose legislation you explain why you go to the well you talk about it and we're losing that we're losing that in you so i mean what did you what was your decision like how did you weigh leaving the house to go to congress and what what played into that decision and yeah thanks for the question so yeah I've, I've had that happen from a few um you know uh, constituents and supporters they say well we we would love to see you in dc but we're going to hate to lose you in the house and so that really was a weight on me at first of all when this happened because we didn't know that doug collins was going to you know, uh, run for Senate. I had no idea that he was going to do that, you know, right in February. You know, we had some rumors happen, you know, back in like November, uh, but it didn't happen. So we didn't think it was going to happen. So when it happened, um, you know, I evaluated things, you know, my first thought was, you know, I, Liberty will die a little bit in the uh, state house. Um, but, you know, I evaluated things. I prayed with my family. Uh, a lot of pe people were coming to me and, and telling me, we need you, your types in DC, someone who stands up, and uh, so, you know, all the doors opened, uh, you know, a lot of support was coming in and encouraging me and our family to do this. We did that. And uh, so far, we made the right decision. I think that God opened the doors up for us. And it was as clear as day that that's something we need to do, be doing. But yeah, when we look on the national level, though, I think a lot of the times when I was on the state level, you know, just by voting no, you know, I vote 40 percent no. Um, you know, that's a common misconception. He votes no to everything. I get attacked a lot for that from the, you know, the left and the right Republicans. Uh, but, you know, compared to everybody else, when they vote 99% yes, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not that bad, really. I always say I agree with them more than I disagree with them because I'm voting, you know, 60% yes. Uh, but when I looked at that, um, you know, I through voting no on the state level, standing on principle, you know, a lot of um, constituents from, you know, not only in my area, but, you know, all throughout the state will come to me and call me all the time and say, well, why did my representative vote no? And I said, well, I don't know. Here, here's why I voted no. I always explain, you know, why I vote yes or why I vote no to a bill. I thought to be ultimately, you know, transparent and accountable to the voters about what I was doing. And that really brought to light, you know, a lot of the corruption that I saw in the state capitol, a lot of the uh, crony capitalism, just bloated budgets and more debt. And so through that education process, a lot of people became, you know, been, we're talking about, you know, unfunded mandates and the proper role of government and subsidies and interference in the free market. So, you know, when I looked at my, you know, evaluating going to Congress, you know, I thought that we could make a huge impact if on the national scale, you know, being a younger man, uh, you know, influencing younger generations to believe back in the Constitution, you know, the proper role of government, what the founders intended could be a massive thing. 
uh, because, you know, we have these crazies like AOCs that are influencing so many young people to believe in socialism. And that's just not going to be very good for our country whatsoever. And so I think that was one of my decisions going into that and there. And, um, yeah, we get on to the national scale and standing on principle. And uh, I guarantee you I'm probably one of the most, if not the most conservative members of Congress uh, based off that. And people know that about me. You know, I stand on principle and I won't compromise. That was the biggest thing. And you know this, Jessica, when you see people go down there, um, they, they compromise. And it really happens on the first vote. If you compromise on your first vote, that budget vote or that whatever it may be, um, you're pretty much done, and they go to the dark side, and the establishment's got you, and then you're justifying every every vote you can ever take. And it really, in all those votes, they grow government. The majority of the votes we take, they grow government in some way or another. And so that's sort of the uh, what I was going towards. You know, um, it took me about ten days to make my mind up because I wanted to make sure I was making the right decision. And we were praying, and then you know, like I said, it all the doors opened up, and it felt like this is exactly what we we need to be doing. And so far, you know, we've been campaigning for. Uh, 58 days, and it's just the support's growing every day. The momentum's growing every day. You know, more volunteers, uh, money's coming every day, and um, yeah, we're, we're it's, it's going really well. Uh, we don't have you for very much longer, but we want to talk about the suspended legislation legislative session. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can give you some insights on that. Um, this is really what I'm talking about when, <laughs> when uh, you know, when people say one thing, they do another. Uh, this was one of the mo- the most egregious examples I've seen. So, you know, we we had our session suspended. I think it was a Thursday or a Friday. And then we got an email from the speaker um, saying that we needed to have a special session on that Monday. So we drove back down. And for some reason, we had, we had to be there 8 o'clock in the morning instead of 10, like usual. But I understand the urgency. So we get there at 8 o'clock. Um, nothing happens for a few hours. There's two pieces of legislation that finally get to our desk uh, around 10 uh, you know, one of them is the emergency powers from the House version, which is uh, 30 days that we'll be able to renew that um, emergency powers to the governor, which I think it was um, at that point was April 13th. But uh, and then there was another um, piece of legislation from the Senate, which basically gave the governor unlimited power to renew his power and no checks from the, the um, legislative branch. And so everybody, you know, everybody I talked to on the floor said we are not voting for we are not going to vote for the unlimited power we need a check on the executive i mean this this is you know this is 101 civics here and uh, Democrats and republicans both all said this that we're going to vote for the 30-day renewal and that that was fair you know that's reasonable and responsible and i thought it was too i voted for it it went to the senate if we it got stuck there for at least three or four hours and we're saying there was certainly some kind of political games being played and so uh it got back over to us and they stripped all that language and they basically put the Senate version back in there. So it would be an unlimited uh, renewal. And then we had to go proactive, proactively go and check the executive when we, we could have fixed it right there. And so everybody was scrambling. And uh, then we had a caucus meeting and the Democrats had a caucus meeting as well. And the leadership told us, uh, you know, if you sign this petition, you know, if we get a certain number of signatures, then we can we can call a special session after you know governor kemp renews his power and we can proactively check his power you know i thought it was just ridiculous you know leadership in general don't trust them i always tell my colleagues like how can you trust untrustworthy people they continue to lie to you all the time about bills and so uh you know i said this is never this is never going to happen there's no way that we're going to come out of a special session on april 15th that was what they were saying you know if governor kemp renews it we can come back in two days later and then we can check his power but why not do it now right and so uh, everybody goes back to the floor. Uh, it was quite astounding. You know, everybody's sort of making excuses up, you know. Oh, well, you know, the, we, we're going to check his power. We're going to have a special session. So well, there's no way we're going to have a special session. This is just a ploy to get everybody to change their votes. And that's what happened. Every single person changed their votes. And what's so astounding about this, though, it set a dangerous precedent. You know, yeah. this is the yeah. first time in Georgia yeah. history, you know, that we had, you know, this type of emergency powers for the health reasons in a pandemic. And so, you know, future governors, you know, Democrat or Republican can go back to us now and say, look, they passed it. You know, the governor can, the governor can have unlimited power. The, the, the executive does not and does not need a check from the legislative branch. <laughs> and, you know, the policy didn't change whatsoever. But in the end, people that, you know, four hours prior said they would never vote for the unlimited. They all voted for it. And I stood alone. So, uh, you know, I stood on principle. I said, look, the policy is the same. We all said we're going to vote for this. And now we're about to vote for it. And uh, it was just astounding to me, you know, how how that works. 
and how people can just change their minds like that. Uh, you know, I think a lot of it had to do with fear, of course. You know, if you vote against the Corona bill, you're going to be attacked, you know, that you love Corona, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's just what they do. But, um, you know, I, I got a lot of support from people all over the state, uh, even messages from out of state that said thank you, you know, for, for voting against that. You know, we, need, we do need to have a check on the executive. That's just common sense. That's just, a, like I said, Civics 101. You know, the legislative branch to check the executive and vice versa. So, yeah, that's that's sort of the rundown of that's sort of my story with it and uh, sort of the inside scoop to it. But it, it was quite astounding that we did that. And now we've renewed it. You know, we have a shelter in place until the 30th of this month. And then we also have, you know, I think that uh, he you know, he renewed it, but it can go up to, well, I think, it now uh, May, May 13th will be the next renewal. Well, any idea when, have, I mean, have you heard any rumblings of when you might go back to finish the regular terrible session? You know, um, no, I don't know. We, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that we haven't given, given much information. You know, we have conference calls, um, you know, with the governor's chief of staff about what's happening. But a lot of the times we find out the information, you know, the day of while the governor's doing press conferences, or even it's just like with, uh, you know, in the house with the leadership with Speaker Ralston and the chairman, they really keep you in the dark as much as they can which is, uh, you know, very insulting to representatives. You know, a lot of times they don't even tell you when the budget bill is going to come up. It's just placed on your desk at a random time and say, oh, great, you're going to have to vote in 24 hours. You know, stuff like that happens routinely. And this is this continue, continuation of that. And I wish that we had more information, you know, uh, from the executive and, you know, from our leadership in the House about what and, and what's going on. And so I don't know. Um, I can kind of kind of think about this personally, my opinion, you know, I don't know when we're going to go back to special session. I would imagine it would be, you know, after the primary, uh, maybe before, but I don't think it would be before this pandemic or this, the orders are going to be lifted. That's just kind of what I'm thinking. Right. Well, that's that's dangerous if it's after the primary, because then you've got a bunch of uh, you could have a bunch of lame ducks that know they're not being held accountable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And, you know, and it's really hard, too, for a lot of these guys. Um you know, they're running, you know, against incumbents right now. And they, or I mean, excuse me, the incumbents, you know, some of the incumbents, they can't even raise money. And some candidates either. I know Colton Moore running for um, state Senate now, you know, he's not allowed to raise any money for his Senate campaign. And that makes it really hard, you know, uh, to try to, to beat an incumbent. So, um, yeah, I, you think that, you know, it's we're still in session. We're just suspended right now. Um, so, if, you know, <laughs> that makes it interesting for a lot of people, for sure. But for me, you know, being right on the federal race you know i was allowed to raise money um when i announced so that that was really awesome for me to do that and that's what we've been doing well thank you so much for joining us um can you tell people where they can learn more about you if they haven't and where they can donate and follow your campaign yeah thank you um yeah mattgertler.com that'll redirect you to matt gertler for congress uh, we only got about 60 days left to go to the election sort of a short little sprint here uh, you know, we're banking on getting to the runoff. I know if we get to the runoff, I can most assuredly probably probably be the next uh, congressman for the district. We're running on my record. It's the most conservative voting record in Georgia. And, um, yeah, this is the most conservative uh, district in, and well, the third most conservative district in the United States of America, actually, the ninth district. Um, so it's right in line with our values and principles. Uh, you can give me a call at 706-490-2285. That's my personal cell phone number. That's 706-490-2285. And feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be glad to answer your questions. My email is matt at mattgertler.com. That's matt at mattgertler.com. And we look forward to hearing from uh, the voters in the ninth, or you know, anybody wants to reach out to us and support our campaign. We're raising money, and we can really use uh, the money. It's all grassroots, you know, funded, and we don't get money from the lobbyists or the big business. I don't vote against that. I, I vote against that. So, uh, you know, uh, this is really about the people in this election, and I think that we'll be successful as long as we get enough people behind us, and it looks like it's going very well for us. And uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, have a good day. You too. Well, it was great having an actual intelligent Matt on the show for once. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was perfect. <laughs> Poor Matt Lowe. We miss you sometimes, Matt Lowe. We, we do. I mean, everybody needs a punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> Matt and I are actually, the, the gun club is opening up for drive through service. And you know, we, we usually meet on Fridays and have a beer. So we're going to sit in our truck six feet away and have, and have beers at the gun club. 
nice. in, in, in the parking lot. Make sure you take your keys out of the ignition and sit in the passenger seat so that you don't get a DUI. A uh, police officer would have to get within 10 feet of me to actually see that the keys are, the keys are in the ignition. <laughs> <laughs> oh god so we might not have a show next week at least not with dave <laughs> do they do the show from from the like the inmate phone we can accept the charges from an inmate of the paulding <laughs> county <laughs> no so, but <laughs> so it's a poll tax it's a poll tax so says the aclu Georgia's election officials are being sued by the American Civil Liberties Union for requiring voters to use their own 55-cent postage stamp to mail in the absentee ballots during the coronavirus pandemic. As if I haven't said coronavirus 10,000 times in the last 30 days. One is a mouthful. The complaint was filed on behalf of Black Voters Matter Fund. Wow. So this is what I was talking about earlier, about how... I'm just irritated by all the lawsuits and the things that are coming because of the way that we're having to do things. First of all, you can still vote in person. The polls aren't closed. They're just trying to discourage it. Like we talked about this on the show, I think two or three weeks ago, and um, all of our guests in the past couple weeks have have talked about how we are trying to discourage in-person voting. And so that's why they're going to mail everyone an absentee ballot application. But they're not saying you can't vote in person right now. We're not there yet, at least. And I don't think we're going to get there. But the, uh, the, uh, argu the argument here is that even though the cost is small, any financial barrier to voting is barred by the Constitution. And they're complicating things because people don't use stamps that often. And so they'd have to go out in public to buy, to buy them. And that violates social distancing rules and puts some self at risk. Where the hell are they getting food? Well, first of all, that. But second, it costs me money to go to the to the polls. If I drive, I'm using gas. If I mean, how is a pen not a poll tax? You have to have a pen to fill out your ballot. What if someone is doesn't have a pen? This is ridiculous. I thought it was a a wise move if we're going to say we're in a we're public health crisis especially to to protect older folks that are in high risk say listen uh, you, we want to make sure you have the opportunity to exercise your constitutional right uh, so we're going to go ahead and send the application to you it's not they're not even sending the, the the ballots it's an application for a ballot if you don't want if you want to go in person if you want to go for it well, and let's not forget that the state is already expending the cost to send you the application and to send you the um, the actual ballot that's mailed to you when you do get it. And why? tell me why you can send your application back for a, a ballot with a stamp on it, and that's not a poll tax, but this is. Right. Because it's a process. Ah, they, I mean, they're, this is, the ACLU should be jumping, I mean, of all the things that are going on right now, they're yes. jumping on a 55 cent stamp instead of jumping on shelter in place, instead of jumping on uh, the Utah governor saying, we're going to, we're going to stop people at the border to ask them what business they have in our state. Throughout I mean, all of this, I have been asking, where are the civil liberties attorneys? What are they doing? And apparently, in place. this is what they're doing. Like, this is their time to shine when a large number of people would back them, no matter what organization it is, the ACLU or whatever, any other civil liberties group, and they're picking a 55-cent stamp, which, mind you, Fair Fight, Stacey Abrams' group, the Fair Fight Action Group, is already coming out swinging about this, and they're already taking a position. You're telling me that there's no nonprofit entities or or for-profit entities or political organizations that would make stamps available for those in need who might not have stamps? Really? What they're doing, what they've done here is they're just laying the groundwork so that after the fact, when the certain elections don't go the way they want, they can say, well, we told you this was gonna happen. If a stamp is the, uh, uh 
is is the the standard for our racism now. I, our society's doing pretty damn well. If that's if that's all you have to come back on is that is that we're disenfranchising people with a with a stamp. It's my God. I mean, of all the things to bitch about in this uh, in this unprecedented suspension of American civil liberties is a fifty five cent stamp. Go in person, you know, roll the dice, go for it. I mean, hell, if you get sick, if you if you can't afford 55 cents, your health care is probably free anyway. Well, I'm with you. And this, so this came, the news of the poll tax lawsuit was, I think, last Wednesday. And then on Thursday, Raffensperger announced that they're going to move the election. And so fair fight action, Stacey Abrams group came out and they said that, you know, we're glad to see that Raffensperger moved the election, but it doesn't, this is their quote, but it does not change the fact that the secretary of state has failed to provide return postage for applications and ballots. And it does not change the fact that he is putting an undue burden and unfunded mandate on counties by failing to centralize the absentee voting operation in the state. Rather than improving administration amid this pandemic, he is wasting time and resources on a so-called fraud task force to intimidate voters. And COVID-19 will remain a threat to our democracy and will likely present this entire year. So there's plenty that the Secretary of State could be doing to provide for safe and accessible voting, both by mail and in person, so that every eligible Georgian's vote can be cast and is counted. I'm failing to see where our eligible voters cannot have their votes cast and counted. The polls are going to be open. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you can't do anything right. It's this is this is team politics. Uh, uh, it is a hundred percent team politics. It, it is, you know, we're worried that we're going to lose. We're going to lose the election, so we're going to. And it's the primary. It's your party. I mean, it's it's the the parties are the states are running party selections. I mean, this is not even the the general. And, and you know, you've said before the parties should have to fund their own damn uh, their own damn primaries. Yeah, for sure. And here's a shining example of why. You know, uh, oh, just good God. Uh, Do you think that the courts will side with them? I don't know. I don't think so because there is a still an opportunity to vote in person. Uh, now, if they close, if they close the polls and say it's gonna, this is the primary is gonna be male only. Um, well, then we all have a lot more problems if that happens, because that's gonna mean a crap ton of other stuffs happening. Right. Well, I think we're gonna. There's gonna be a lot of stress on the polls because if this is still a thing, there are, you're not gonna find many poll workers because they tip. They are typically older. What do you think about having like a centralized? Well, see, here's a, because they're talking about a centralized thing. If you, if you have a centralized drop-off location, like, uh, like similar to the, what we put our mail in at the post office drive through the blue boxes, the problem with that becomes, well, that's, that one's too far for me or I couldn't get there. Or, you know, they should have one on, you know, when you're talking about rural counties or Fulton County or however, no matter what, no matter where you look, it's going to be wrong. They're going to be ticked no matter what. So I don't know what they're talking about with this centralized process because somebody, voting is a right, but just like all of the other rights, you have to be vigilant in protecting it and exercising it. Like you actively exercise your rights. Right, I have a right to bear arms, but I don't have a right to. I, no one had. I don't have a right to make the government give me uh, give me a gun. Yeah. Uh, there you have, there has to be some sort of personal responsibility. You know, I, I think voting should be as difficult as possible. I mean, you should have to put some effort into it. Uh, I I I don't want us going to an American Idol model. Well, go go online, pick up the phone, and cast your vote. You know, I want I want people to to have to exert some effort, so that means people who actually care about the issues are going to vote. You know, and I, and I know that's not a 
popular opinion, but if there's a central, I don't have a problem with central drop off. It's just, but it won't be enough. Well, I understand it won't be enough, but it, we also don't have the the mechanism in place to do that. You, I mean, you have to start changing election law to do stuff like that. You also have to create the boxes in every in every county. Uh, yes, a secure box. What does it have to be manned and protected too? I mean, how are you going to ensure that that's? Can it only be dropped off on election day? I mean, how far are we really going to go with this? It puts and, somebody. It puts somebody in mop level four checking IDs before you drop it off too. Well, and on top of that, like all the time and money that these groups are spending being ticked off about this, they could be, I mean, they have, Stacey Abrams' Verified Group has so much money. She could buy stamps for every person who might possibly need a dang stamp. Thank you. I just thought about it and it fell out of my head. Thank you. Exactly. If she cared that much, uh, she could could create a, a, a... a nonprofit called, I don't know, Stamps for Poffers, uh, you know, Stamps for the Indigent, and go and g- deliver a 55 cent stamp to anybody who wants them. Ah, man. It's petty on the, on the, on the surface, but I, but I think you're right. This is laying the, 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 the groundwork for a larger challenge in December. Because there, she's never going to be happy with the results. But the uh, uh, the only thing she could be challenging is the the primary results. Because you know, God willing, this won't be a problem in November. Right. Hopefully, God willing. Yeah, because if it's, if it is, I'm not going to have my trip to Paris. And it is all about me. That's right. So, weed is booming among the COVID-19 pandemic. Two dealers spoke to NPR anonymously. Well, I can well hope so. <laughs> to discuss their business changes during the shutdown. Um, did you read the article? Not to put you on the spot, but did you read the article? No, I did not read the article. <laughs> well, that's because I put it on the outline. But I read the article and... I thought it was hilarious. We didn't. You don't need to read the article to know what we're talking about. But the the point that we're, where we're going with this is that people are bored. And you asked me before the show started if my alcohol consumption had increased, and it absolutely has because I don't have to get up at the crack of dawn to bust my behind working, and I have more free time, and I'm you know all these things. I saw this quote the other day that was like, I found out that I don't need fun to have alcohol. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so true. But so. These dealers spoke to NPR, Georgia's GPB, and they put out this long expose on how their business has changed and how it's booming because people are home. And instead of, um, and that there truly is an, an eye, a side of people who are using it for anxiety, I guess, but also um, that, you know, it's changed their delivery mechanism because they're no longer handing it off. They'll leave it at the doorstep or... Um, they're delivering in the form of edibles instead of so that you can smoke it because of the respiratory side of COVID-19 and just all these things. It was really funny. But I think the bigger notion is that people are bored. People are bored. And this is the best law enforcement you will ever see in this country ever. You have, there has to be a victim for anybody to go and, and come after you because the police officers don't want to be in your face either. Just like we were talking before the show about the, the, the awesome videos that are coming out where they're like, oh, that guy's definitely speeding, but he probably also has the, has the Rona. Uh, so no one's looking for the dope man. So there's a, there's a Wild West aspect to uh, maybe people who'd be a little more concerned with with ha- with possessing it and they're like ah well they're not looking for it right now plus i mean i don't have i don't have any you know crotch goblins myself but i mean i'm sure that at a certain point after you've homeschooled your kids for for six hours like you know what i'm gonna go out to the shed and burn one my my worry would be somebody who, who i mean i guess i don't know 
I'd worry. I'd worry about the Rona be being in it. You mean, like, uh, because of all the hands, it's changing. Yeah, because there's no, it's, it, you know, restaurants have a standard. Uh, you know, the, if you go and you buy something at Walgreens, there's a standard of how things are handled. You buy weed. I mean, even an edible. It was cooked up at some dude's house. Like some dude with a gray ponytail, and and, and uh, uh, is is making your cookies and brownies and stuff. So I don't know. I'm a paranoid person anyway. With that, I was, you know, when I when I buy liquor, it's self cleansing. Ah, of course. Which you know, you know, I try to keep a minimum of a point oh six, because alcohol kills the virus. I actually, I actually did make hand sanitizer out of Everclear. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's 95%. Mm-hmm. I mean, that stuff should not be taken internally. It'll kill you. But uh, if you can't find rubbing alcohol, hell, that stuff's 95%. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I, I certainly, I, people have time. I mean, it, even with people, single people, you're, you're sitting around, you can't, you can't go out, there's no place to go, and they're the government's literally telling you to stay home and play video games, order pizza, stay home. So, I mean, it lends itself to, you know, being the dude sitting around in your bathrobe all day, smoking a joint and, and, uh, and playing video games. Not that's what I'm doing. Of course not. I mean, I don't like the smell of the stuff. I mean, it's the biggest, biggest thing. It smells terrible. It does. I mean, it's, I, I support the whole idea of edibles because you don't have to smell what your neighbors are doing. But, and, and again, I don't think anybody would get any pushback from us on, on you know, you should, it sh there shouldn't be any criminal aspect to what you, what you put, an adult puts in his body. But I do think it is interesting that dealers are practicing social distancing, which is awesome. Well, it's funny because, well, it's not that funny, but it's a little bit ironic, I guess. But, you know, North Fulton, Alpharetta, Johns Creek, and Roswell, they have been known, and a little bit of Cobb, they've been known as like the, what is um, what is the word for it? Like the Bermuda Triangle of opioids oh. and heroin. And it, it, I remember there was this long expose on what they do and the dealers and how they discreetly bring it to suburbia and, and drop it at your door like you're delivering, you know, a, a pair of shoes from the department store or something. And it was so shameful and they couldn't believe it. And now it's like, well, that's so respectable that they're buying their weed and it's, they're still social distancing. It's what was taboo is now honorable. Well, it's, I don't know. I, I certain I certainly understand it. If weed is your thing, and you would be consuming more of it, I mean, it's it's like it's like food. You know, all the memes going around Facebook with uh, with uh, uh, so when this is all over, does my six hundred pound life contact me, or do I have to get in touch with them? How does it work? <laughs> or the 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 picture of the uh, coffee cup running and handing the baton to the wine glass that says every day. Yep. <laughs> For sure. So what, whatever your vice is, is certainly certainly going to be is going to be increased during this. Like I said, I, I I have I would have reservations about about something that you don't necessarily know the cleanliness of how people are taking care of it uh, coming into coming into your house. It's very adult of you. <laughs> very paranoid. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I'm paranoid. It's I mean, it's it's fine. So, do you have any closing thoughts? I do, and we have a, a, a few minutes, so mine's a little bit longer, but it only because, for once, I actually want your opinion. But there was a... <laughs> <laughs> on my closing thought, not generally, of course. Um, no, there was a, a lawsuit filed this week against the GEO Group, which is a private prison company, and it was filed against the division of the GEO Group that manages all of the ICE facilities in the country, um, because they're making inmates or detainees rather clean common areas and they don't have PPE 
or sanitizer or soap. Nothing antibacterial, nothing sterilized, nothing to protect them from um, the elements. And I think that it presented a really odd position for a lot of people because like at first you're like, well, you, you've got the Republicans who are like, well, if they hadn't if they hadn't come here illegally, we wouldn't even have to talk about this. But they are here and we're dealing with it and we're having the conversation about it. And all they want, they're not trying to be released or anything, although there are people who want them released, but they just want the supplies should they become available um, or they don't want to have to clean the common areas in the meantime because if they don't clean them, they're facing solitary confinement, which is a whole other issue. But I wanted to know what you think about it because from my perspective, like we can either pay for the supplies or we can pay to treat them when there's an outbreak in the facility. And I think the treatment is a lot more expensive than the supplies, but you may feel differently. Is it the money or is it the availability of the supplies? I think it's a combination. If it's the money, absolutely. They, if you're, if you're asking them to to do that uh, or telling them to do that, then you need to, even if it's the, the best PPE you can, you can provide. And that's a, a lot of what's going on is you got to do the best you can with what you have. If it is going to the laundry and cutting cutting a face shield, uh, you know, bandanas, and giving the the plastic um, food service gloves, something. And the fact that they don't, they don't have antibacterial soap or anything. I mean, just like I was talking about the the using Everclear to do the best I can to make hand sanitizer, is adapt and overcome. You 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 are you are obligated to protect people in your custody to the best of your ability. Uh, and it, it, when it comes down to things just aren't available, it's, I'm sorry, I, I can't. And if, and if you, if you came before me and I was sitting on the jury and they and you said, look, here's the situation. Here's the, here's our purchase orders. Uh, they were not being filled. It was not available. Sl- supply chain interruption. We couldn't get it. Like, Hey, listen, they did the best they can. Uh, so I think it's a having the inmates clean it it's not it's not a problem but I think they really 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 need to do whatever humanly possible to protect them and keep keep it from spreading because well, gonna... I think it's I think it's disgusting that they're threatening solitary if you don't I mean that's like one of the most extreme forms of punishment that we have right oh it's, that's that's jail inside of jail because uh, you know they can't beat you. I mean that's 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 jail jail. Uh, usually with any sort of work detail, people are uh, people are volunteering because it's time away from their day. It's doing anything. Uh, that's why the most trusted inmates are the ones that are doing the drives that we don't want to do, picking up trash on the side of the road. Um, but they are under an obligation to protect uh, protect who is in their custody. And look, releasing them is not is not the, the most awful thing either. Uh, especially when we're talking about uh, we're talking about detainment for for uh, illegal immigration. Obviously, violent criminals are a different different thing. But put ankle bracelets on them. When this is over, go pick them back up. I don't know, man. Hmm. It it would it would save everybody money. Except for the private prison, who gets paid per per uh, per prisoner, it would save everybody money to just put an ankle bracelet on them, monitor them, and go and pick them up when it's over. Or hell, give them the option of being deported immediately. Hey, listen, you want out of here? Sign sign, uh, sign this, and we'll take you back to your country. Uh, back to, back to your country. Right. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think we've talked about that as well, though. There's been times when they have not presented that as an option. Like, they won't let them. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't type thing. Well, you can't have... You can't have jury trials right now. You can't... Look, if the guy if the guy killed three people and is being held there, obviously, we're not, we're not releasing that guy. But the dude that's been caught three times coming to this country to work, give him the option of going home. Right, he'll come back again, and we'll deal with it again. But just send him back. What? Why are we detaining him for 
He probably doesn't want to be be here right now anyway. Everybody's sick. Right. So yeah, that's the same thing where we've got people on on a, a Republican pages, you know, whining and complaining about uh, DeKalb County releasing nonviolent criminals because <laughs> they don't they don't seem to understand that we have to pay to treat them if if they get sick. It, the higher the density. Well, you should, dumbass. You know, you shouldn't do the crime. You can't do the time. What about all the prison guards? What about all the, you know, the people that work in the cafeteria? The people that do. You're exposing everybody when you have a high population. The lower the population, the less likely it is to spread. The more you can keep people apart, the less likely it is to spread. And everybody is safer. And it's jail, not prison. These folks are in there for less than 12 months. They're typically not there, unless it's pretrial, for violent crimes. This, these are misdemeanors. But people, people are, hmm. Anyway, getting to mine. Last week, during the uh, daily uh, coronavirus briefing, which I think is way too much. It's the same crap every day. You know, they, they have lowered the number of reporters in the room for social distancing. So it's a fairly big honor to be, to be in that room, to be one of the reporters that can, that can ask the president a question. Uh, and there's no, I have no problem with asking tough, fair questions. Uh, but these questions that he's being asked, someone, one of the reporters asked him about Joe Exotic from Lion, uh, from Tiger King, Lion King. Oh, uh, asked about Joe Exotic. Lion and, King. Yeah. <laughs> uh, about Joe Exotic and, and pardoning him. And they, are, are you kidding me? You could ask him about about the uh, Chinese disinformation campaign. You could you could ask him about responses. You could ask him about PPE, about ventilators, about anything related to the the and I put air quotes around crisis right now. But you decided to go with Tiger King, and Trump is just kind of like, I don't know. I'll look into it. I don't know. I just you have. A rare opportunity that reporters, tens of thousands of reporters in this world would love to be in that room and be able to ask uh, the President of the United States a question and you waste your 30 seconds on Tiger King. Jackass. Well, it's kind of like with the, the people who asked Kemp last week during his press conference what his opinion or what he would tell people who were worried about Trump saying it's the China virus and how how they should handle racism. I mean, what? <laughs> First of all, why is Kemp having, why are we, why do we care what Kemp thinks about what Trump said? You're at, we're here at a press conference about what Kemp's doing for the state. With the GEMA director, the Department of Public Health director, and the dang National Guard general. And that's the best you can come up with? He's talking about suspending uh, the rights of Americans. And you're going to ask him about whether it's right to to call it the Chinese virus? That's right. Uh, You know, it's... I don't know, man. It's, It's so petty. It the, the the career of a journalist is has been reduced to nothing but gotchas. I I, I, want, I want to give you that gotcha. There are legitimate questions to ask, like what's the role of the National Guard in this? Well, obviously you're here, General. What what do you perceive as your role? All that are legitimate questions, even tough questions about about their response. Do you think you acted too slow? Do you think you moved too fast? Do you think? Uh, it doesn't go far enough. Does it go too far? You can ask legitimate questions, and you're going to ask about Trump calling it the Chinese virus. These, these, it, it's, it, it's turning into a damn reality show. Yep. So anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to our guest Matt Gertler. Thank you to our editor Eric Cumby. I'm Dave Roberts, and for Jessica Salaji, have a great week. <laughs>